This is a lecture from Open Tuition. To benefit from the lecture, you should download the free lecture notes from OpenTuition.com. I went to chapter one here of the structure of the legal system, the English legal system, and the first thing I need to do is distinguish between civil law and criminal law because to a substantial extent, criminal law is not part of the F4 syllabus. There are bits, there are illegal criminal acts which are mentioned within the syllabus and which we do cover within the lectures, but it's a tiny part. We're not going to get involved in, in mass murders and rapes and burglaries and so on. We do get incidents, we touch on little bits, but, but nothing, nothing so exciting as a mass murder running amok amongst the F4 syllabus. So, we're looking at civil law, and I'm going to distinguish civil law from criminal law, and that's effectively all I'm going to talk about criminal law when we get there in about five minutes' time. Civil law is private law. It's private law, which is uh, a dispute, as a written, between two individuals, whether those be human individuals or companies, it doesn't matter. It's a dispute that has arisen and one party feels that they have been wronged, they have been injured and they're therefore seeking legal redress against the wrongdoer, against the, the other party, typically in a contract, the other party to the contract and asking for compensation. So civil law, it's private law, it's typically between two individuals. It's to settle these disputes and it's often mistaken to be the case that punishment is involved. That's not right. In civil law, we're not looking at any concept of punishment. All we're looking for is redress. We're looking for compensation, basically, because we have suffered because of the wrongful acts of the other party in, in a contract. The objective, therefore, is compensation. And what we're looking to do is we need to establish the, the burden of proof is on the plaintiff. It's up to the plaintiff to show that the other party has been done wrong, that the other party has broken, for instance, a contract, and, and that you, the plaintiff, have suffered as a result of that action by the other party. So the burden of proof lies with you, the, the plaintiff, the, the innocent party, the injured party. But when we're looking at the extent of proof necessary, we're looking at beyond reasonable doubt. Sorry, I've got that wrong. We're looking at the balance of probabilities, um, the balance of probabilities, not on reasonable doubt. On reasonable doubt is the other one. So you, the plaintiff, are looking to prove on the balance of probabilities that this other party has in fact broken their side of the contract and you, as a result, have suffered in um, typically a financial in injury. If that's the case and you wish to resort to legal help to get the courts to resolve the matter for you, if it's the case that, that you have suffered then you will take an action which results in you suing the uh, wrongful party in court. You take out a suit uh, very much like a, a suit that I'm wearing, it's spelled the same, but of course it's different. To take out a, 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 a legal action against the wrongdoer and take them to court and, and ask them or make them attend in court in order that this dispute can be resolved by a judge or an arbitrator. If they're liable, then they will have to pay you compensation. And compensation is normal, normally a monetary amount. There is a general principle within English law that says if damages is a sufficient remedy, then damages will be awarded. So damages therefore would be a monetary compensation to put you into the position that you would have been in if that contract had not been broken. The two people involved, I've already mentioned that you're the plaintiff, you're the one that has suffered the wrong. So you're the plaintiff and the other person is the defendant. It, alternatively, we could call you the claimant and the defendant. You're registering a claim against this other person. So the plaintiff or the defendant. And if it goes to appeal, then you are the appellant 
If you are the one making the appeal to the higher court, you are the appellant and the other party is the respondent. It's a personal action brought by the agreed party. It's not brought by the uh, Crown Prosecution Service. It's the, the aggrieved, it's the injured party that brings the action to court. It's the injured party that takes out suit against the other person and they then, the defendant, has to attend in court on the specified date. The court may award damages and they will award damages if damages is an appropriate remedy. But if damages is not appropriate, if the monetary compensation is, it, it doesn't compensate you, if, for instance, you were in a contract to buy a unique piece of porcelain from some ancient Chinese dynasty and the other person and you'd arranged to purchase this for a hundred pounds and the other party wasn't aware of the true value of this, then they discover what the true value is and so they try to say, no, 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 I'm not going to go ahead with this contract, it's worth more than a hundred pounds. And you say, but that's what we agreed. And if they say, no, I'm not going ahead, then you will take legal action. Well, what have you lost? Because that's what damages is there to do, is to compensate you for your, for your loss, for your expenses, for the money that you have spent. You've not lost anything. So damages, even a hundred pounds worth of ours, is not sufficient remedy. You're there about to purchase this £40,000 vase for £100 and it's been agreed in a contract. Yes, £100 compensation, even £40,000 compensation is not enough. You have agreed to buy that vase and it's irreplaceable and there's nothing like it and it's unique and it's going to be yours and it is rightfully yours because you contracted to buy it. Damages is not sufficient. And so the court may rarely award an equitable remedy. And there are therefore two different types of remedy available. They used to be in separate courts. They used to be the common law courts and the equity courts. But then they got merged under this 1873 to 75 Judicature Acts. And so they're now administered. These two separate types of remedy are administered by the same judges in the same court. Damages will be awarded if damages is sufficient. If damages is not sufficient, then the judges have available to them the award of an equitable remedy. And we'll look at equitable remedies within this chapter, not too far away. So that's private law, civil law. It's private, it's two individuals. But now we look at criminal law, because this is public law. This is where our wrongdoer has not broken a contract, our wrongdoer has broken the law. Our wrongdoer has, has wronged society and he's, he's broken society's rules which are encapsulated within statute, within law. So our wrongdoer has done a wrong to society and so they're prosecuted. They're not sued in court. Remember in civil law the wrong is done to an individual. In criminal law, the wrong is done to society. In civil law, you're sued in court. In criminal law, you're prosecuted in court. If guilty, you're punished. No concept of punishment in civil law, it's compensation. But if you're guilty in criminal law, then you're punished. Punishment is both to, to punish the offender and also to set an example to other people so that they too won't consider breaking that law. They will be deterred from breaking that law. Community service, fine or imprisonment are the um, typical punishments that may be meted out uh, as a result of breaking the law. And the prosecutor and accused, remember in civil law we have the plaintiff and the defendant, or sometimes the claimant, and the defendant, and then we go to appeal, and that's the appellant and the respondent. Well, in criminal law, we have prosecutor and accused. And again, we have the appellant and respondent, but it's prosecutor and accused of the two prime parties at the, the time of first hearing this case. Burden of proof is on the prosecutor. It's up to the prosecutor to establish guilt, uh, whereas in the uh, civil law, it's up to the plaintiff to establish wrong has been suffered by them uh, and that they have suffered as a result of the wrongful acts of the other. So here we have prosecutor and accused 
The burden of proof lies with the prosecutor. The level of proof is what I made a mistake in the, the civil law. The level of proof is beyond reasonable doubt. Not on the balance of probabilities, beyond reasonable doubt. So it's quite a lot more extensive is the burden of proof, more heavy, more onerous the burden of proof for a, a criminal um, case. The police decide whether to prosecute, and that decision by the police is then confirmed or uh, agreed upon by the Crown Prosecution Service. That totally not applicable in civil law. It is possible, it is possible to have um, a single action which is both a wrong against the individual and a wrong against society. The television presenter Jan Leeming, oh, many years ago now, was assaulted by a person within the BBC, uh, not employed, but within the BBC buildings. And this person had a, a glass of acid, and as Jan Leeming walked along the corridor towards him, the acid was thrown at her face and, and severely burned her. Well, that was both a criminal act of assault, but it was also trespass, which is a civil wrong. It was trespass against the person. <laughs> Incidentally, that's interesting. Trespass, I just said, is a civil wrong. It's not a criminal act. So when you see a sign on a field, at the entrance to a field, that says private property, trespassers will be prosecuted. No, they won't. Trespassers may be sued, but it's private law, it's civil law, it's nothing to do with prosecution, it's nothing to do with the police, it's nothing to, nothing to do with establishing guilt or innocence. It's private law, so trespassers won't be prosecuted. They may be sued, but not prosecuted. Jan Leeming, that was assault, and assault is a crime, but it was also trespass against her person, and that is a civil wrong. So that one single action taken by that individual of throwing acid in Jan Leeming's face was both a civil and a criminal act. A civil wrong and a criminal act. I mentioned common law courts and I mentioned equity courts. And we have these two branches of law and they were distinct branches and they they were established back in 16th century, these two separate branches. Before that, we only had the one branch, we only had common law. But the whole thing, let me just go back. I'm going to go through history, very brief. I'm going to go through the best part of a thousand years worth of history, and it's going to take me 10 minutes. So that's the history for you. Those of you who may be history graduates, I'm sorry, but this is, this is a very, very quick a summary of a thousand years. 1066 it all started when William the Conqueror came over at the invitation of the uh, the British who were not happy with King Harold and the rule of Harold. So William uh, came over from Normandy with his French troops and landed somewhere in, in Hastings and had a battle there in a town which is now called Battle. Shot an arrow, hit King Harold and, and so our life was changed evermore. So 1066, it was started, and William said, well, this, when it, they established how the legal system, such as it was, operated in, in England and Wales, William said, this is ridiculous. So he sent out king's representatives to sit in on the local lords, the local barons, and listen to them as they heard complaints in their neighbourhood. And, and every now and then these representatives would ride back to London and all have a big meeting. And one would say, you know, I was sitting in a court in Manchester the other day and this happened and this happened and that was the, the, uh, the result and that was the judgment that was given. And someone said, do you know, I had exactly the same in mind, but the judgment was rather different. And so we had this variation from shire to shire, from county to county. And eventually this meeting said, well, of those two, which one do we prefer? That sounds a fairer remedy. That, that was a better remedy that was handed out in Nottingham than was handed out in Manchester. And then the, when they go back again to their various places, the representative is sitting maybe and listening in. And that's all they did was listen. They didn't, didn't pass judgment. They listened. And then in Derby, for instance, ten years later, the Earl of Derby is giving his judgment, and, and the representative says, can I have a look at the 
idea because we, we discussed this at our, our meeting 10 years ago in London. And we decided that the sensible way to, to sort this problem out was to award compensation to this person rather than that person. And slowly, 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 very slowly, over 200 years, English law became common throughout the country because these representatives would, would say, and they would persuade the local baron and say, this was what we thought was a good idea. And slowly, over 200 years, English law was commonized, and hence the expression, the law was common, it became common law. So that if I committed an offence in Liverpool and then committed another offence in, in Arundel, uh, then the decision about my offence would be the same, or it would be more likely to be very, very similar, as distinct from diametrically opposite. So that's how it, English law was commonized. But you know, there's a, a problem here that not all wrongs are capable of being redressed by an award of damages, by monetary compensation. And there was a number of, a number of defects within the common law, the English system as it stood. Um, for instance, you could, you could plead innocence or plead ill health. Uh, and stay out of court for a year and a day you could plead ill health and then when he eventually got to court and you could no longer plead ill health then the, the baron would say to one person or another call witnesses and, and they say well, do you remember what's happening on November the 15th uh, a year ago and they'd say no I can't actually I don't, I don't remember. and don't forget we're talking here 500 years ago 400 500 years and at a time when not many people were able to write and, and fewer still could read. So when you were asked, what were you doing a year ago? I can't even remember what I was doing a week ago. Can you? So when you're asked, what were you doing a year ago today? One year ago today, what were you doing? And if you can't remember, then what you see was a witness. Because you couldn't have written it down. You can't take out your, your jacket pocket, your little notebook, and sit at, at 4.15 on Monday or whenever. This is what I was doing. You couldn't do that. So this uh, plea of Asians, it was called, the plea of Asians, which is not likely to be asked, but the plea of Asians was available, and so people were able to delay, 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 until eventually the value of the witnesses and the value of their statement was such that it was negligible. It was, there was hardly any value to it at all. Another um, failing was the lack of any concept of the of a trust that if I for whatever reason if I were to give you this this magic pen uh, for you to hold on my behalf in my absence and then when I come back I can have it back I'm putting you I'm placing this pen the trust property into the hands of you, the trustee, for the benefit either of me or of someone else, the beneficiary. So when I come back and say, can I have my pen back? And you say, no, you gave it to me. Well, what am I meant to do? Am I meant to fight you for it or kill you for it? Or if I've given it to you and asked you to hold it in trust for the benefit of a beneficiary, then I gave it to you and you may feel free to use it. But it goes to court, the court's got no idea. Of, no, there's no concept of a trust within, within common law. So over the commonization period, this 200 year period, it became apparent that there were deficiencies within the common system and that there was no standard way of, of dealing with them because there was no way of dealing with them. It had never been brought to court before. So the only thing available to me would be to go to London and try to get an audience with the king and say to the king, I mean, come on, but you say to the king, uh, your majesty, your majesty, I'm having a bit of trouble with my name, right? I gave him my pen to look after, my computer pen to look after, and he won't give it me back. And I asked him to look after it for the benefit of me whilst I was away. I didn't want to lose it. And so the king says, I can't be bothered with you. 
I can't be bothered. I've been fighting in in Jerusalem to recover Jerusalem for the, 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 the sake of the Christians. So I'm, I'm too tired, I'm too busy. Go and see the Lord Chancellor. So at that time, and I'm not being blasphemous here, so don't any of you take offence. But at that time, it was believed, and we're talking five, six hundred years ago, it was believed that the concept of equitus, where is it? The concept of equitus. Equitus, equally, equality, equity, equitus. At the time it was believed that the God, the King and the Chancellor were in direct communication. In the eyes of God, it's the same. Things are the same in the eyes of God, the King and the Chancellor. And these three, this, this triumvirate, if you like, were as one. So if it's the same in the eyes of God, the King and the Chancellor, there's no point talking to the King and Unless you're deeply, deeply religious, then you're not likely to think that God is intervened with thunderbolts and lightning and so on. So you had to go and talk to the Chancellor. And the Chancellor had to make decisions, and, and then it got too busy. And so the Chancellor then appointed other people to make decisions for him. And so developed the Court of Chancellor, the Chancellor's Court. And the Chancellor appointed his own judges. And these judges, administered the Chancellor's idea of law. In the eyes of God, the King and the Chancellor, all things are equal, all things are equitous. And that became then the Courts of Equity. And the Courts of Equity developed innovative remedies beyond the scope of damages as compensation. They came up with some radical new ideas, which we're coming to later on in this chapter. So they met in London, common law, cornerstones, judicial precedent. Judicial precedent says that where a, a person, it's this idea of Manchester and Nottingham and Arundel and Liverpool, it's the idea that one should establish what is the right thing to do given these circumstances, then subsequent people hearing a similar case will reach the same conclusion and give the same judgment, and that's judicial precedent. That, that once you've established what is the correct remedy, then subsequent cases with those similar facts will also provide that correct remedy. But how do you determine which bit of the remedy is binding upon later judges? And that's where we come to these two Latin phrases. I'm sorry about this, but Latin does, is quite prevalent throughout uh, English law, but that's where we come to these two bits of Latin, ratio decidendi and obita dicta. And what happens here is that a judge will make the decision, it's the first time, it's not, he's not following some earlier decision, he's making a decision about a particular set of circumstances, and he's summarising the case, he says, oh, you did this, and he's got it all written down in front of him, because he was one of the people that could write, or the scribe was one of the people that could write, and he's written it all down, and, and you did this, and then you did that, and then you said this, and he did that, and then the witnesses, and then they go through, and they summarise the whole thing, and then he'll, he'll build up towards his conclusion, and therefore I'm going to say that you should get the right to receive money, or you should get the right to take the cow from your neighbour, whatever the decision was. But in all of that, from the moment he started speaking, or she started speaking, to the end, it's all one long summary, one long decision-making process. Well, you can't base later decisions on this great long... Nowadays, it can take days or weeks for the judge to summarise the case. You can't base a later decision on a, upon a week's worth of blah, 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 blah. So what we have to do is get this week-long summary and, and take a little snippet of it and say that, that little bit there, that is the fundamental reason why this judge reached that decision. That is the rationale of the decision. That is the rationale of the decision. It's the ratio decidendi. 
of the decision. And that is the fundamental bit. Anything else is other things said by the way. And if I were to translate that into Latin, it would become obiter dicta. Other things said, dicta is obviously said, other things said by the way, incidental. It's not, it's not that important, all this other summary, blah, 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 blah. What is really important is the ratio decidendi. With commonization came recognition of the deficiencies, highlights of the need for alternative remedies, the Chancellor's Court, the Chancellor's Judges, the Chancellor's own legal system, the Courts of Chancellor, the, the Chancellor's Courts and the Chancellor's Judges, and the Chancellor's Judges' remedies, equitable remedies. Common law is damages. And common law courts separate from the courts of equity. Until late into the 19th century, the Judicature Acts of 1873 to 75. 